Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today, or perhaps even good evening, as I know we've got some international members of our audience. Um, welcome to the first of CFN's webinar series for 2022. We're delighted to have Dr. Deborah Cook joining us today to speak to us about Prospect, probiotics to prevent severe pneumonia and endotracheal colonization trials. So this is part of a CFN transformative grant, and we're very happy to have Dr. Cook here today to share her results. So today's webinar will be hosted by myself, Dr. Jeanette Prorock. I am the Manager of Special Projects and Initiatives at CFN. We will begin with a presentation by Dr. Cook, followed by as many questions as time permits at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you're not familiar with Zoom, you'll see that we have a Q&A function where you can enter your questions there. Um, there's also a chat function and comments in the chat will come to ourselves as the hosts and panelists and we'll be able to see those as well. The webinar slides and the video recording from today will be available for viewing within one to two days on our website at cfn-nce.ca forward slash webinars. So we invite you um, to share that with your colleagues who may not have been able to join us here today, as well as review the um, webinar again if you're um, so inclined. We also have a few more webinars planned as part of our CFN webinar series. The next one will be on Wednesday, January 26th at the same time from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern time. That Our speaker for that webinar will be Dr. Mary Lou Kelly from Lakehead University, and she'll be speaking to us about Let's Talk About Later Life. Compassionate Ottawa presents three resources to start community conversations, another CFN funded project. Um, if you're interested in any further webinars, please monitor our website. We um, keep it up to date with upcoming webinars there. We have four others currently scheduled um, on February 9th and February 16th. Um, those will focus on ICANN ACP, um, so a two-part webinar series there. The first week we'll have um, Dr. Sharon Kasselainen, Dr. Tamara Sussman and Dr. Michelle Howard speaking to us about ICANN ACP in primary care and long-term care. And the second part on February 16th, we'll, we will have um, Dr. Gloria Gutman speaking to us about diversity access within that project. March 3rd and March 10th, which is a Thursday, a change from our usual Wednesdays, but still at 12 to 1, we will have Dr. Her John Hurdies on March 3rd and Dr. George Heckman on March 10th from 12 to 1 speaking to us about their Better Targeting Better Outcomes for Frail Elderly Babel Project. So we invite you to mark those in your calendars and join us for the next webinars in our series as well. So a little bit about our presenter today. As I mentioned, we're very happy to, and pleased to have Dr. Deborah Cook speaking to us about the PROSPECT project. Um, Dr. Cook practices critical care medicine at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. Um, at McMaster University, she is professor of medicine in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics, and she's also the academic chair of critical care medicine. Her multi-method, multidisciplinary disciplinary research includes life support technology, risk factors for critical illness, prevention of ICU-acquired complications, end-of-life choices, and research ethics. Her methodological work has helped improve the design, implementation, and reporting of randomized trials and systematic reviews. As the Canada Research Chair of Research Transfer and Intensive Care and the former chair of the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group, Dr. Cook has published 500 peer review articles and supervised many trainees and faculty. She has received numerous local, national, and international awards for her clinical, educational, and research excellence, including the Fellowship of the Royal Society. So with that, I will we'll stop sharing my screen and I will turn you over, turn it over to you, Dr. Cook, and invite you to share um, some more about your prospect trial with us. Thanks very much uh, to Jeanette and to all the members of Canadian Frailty Network uh, organizationally and from the membership 
Um, I'm really delighted to present this uh, funded project from uh, Canadian Frailty Network and a number of other organizations on behalf of the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group, some colleagues in Saudi Arabia, Yassine Arabi and group, and some colleagues in the US and the co-PI, Dr. Jenny Johnson, an infectious disease uh, clinician from the University of Toronto. The Method Center team, uh, as well as all the research coordinators and investigators really helped to uh, bring this question alive and the research question for this trial was uh, whether in critically ill patients who are expected to need the invasive mechanical ventilator for at least three days, does the probiotic lactobacillus or amnosis GG prevent ventilator associated pneumonia? Any other infections, diarrhea, which is a common problem in critical illness, and other additionally clinically important outcomes compared with placebo. So there have been several studies evaluating probiotics and critical illness. Uh, this is one that was just published in September last year, uh, 2,600 patients and 44 different units. So the public is becoming much more aware now than in the past about the role of bacteria. We traditionally are washing our hands and practicing good hand hygiene and trying to get rid of bugs, considering them germs. But in fact, the organisms, the either bacteria, fungi, or viruses that live in us or on us uh, comprise a very, very important part of life. And we know now that modification of these bugs, collectively known as the microbiome, can have important uh, implications for health. All of us are outnumbered from the cellular perspective and from the genetic perspective uh, regarding the genetic material that uh, is on us or in us compared with the human cells. And the so-called healthy microbiome is in some flux from day to day, but when we become ill or particularly critically ill, the pathobiome is modified very much, whether or not the critical illness is due to infection. So the same phenomena of a modified microbiome occurs whether there's a motor vehicle accident or some other non-infectious problem like pancreatitis. So when people become critically ill, obviously they have a lot of advanced and basic life supports. And the hope is that recovery, rehabilitation will ensue. And then the unhealthy pathobiome uh, becomes once again a healthy microbiome. One way by which this could occur is through biotics. Much more than biotics is needed to help critically ill patients get better. But the commonest biotic everyone will be aware of is antibiotics. There are other biotics though, and one topic for today is the probiotic. So what is understood now in healthcare is this it's warranted to be extremely interested in the microbiome and microbiome modification was thought to hold some promise to try to help critically ill patients survive and improve their quality of life. This represents the number of citations in biomedical literature going up and up and up about the microbiome. Well, what are probiotics? Many of you probably take probiotics, whether you know it or not, in pill form or in yogurt or uh, any other, um, uh, food or beverage substances such as kombucha or kimchi, uh, but probiotics technically, according to WHO, are referred to as commercially available microorganisms which, when ingested as individual strains or in combinations, offer potential health benefits to the host. Prebiotics, however, are non-digestible food components that occur in traditional food substances that uh, we all eat and also are found in feeding solutions that um, are given to patients who are in hospital. So together prebiotics and probiotics are referred to as synbiotics. But what was tested in many of the trials outside the ICU in the hospital as well as in the community are really probiotics. These are some of the commercially available agents, which you perhaps have seen in uh, drugstores and in supermarkets. Culturel was the one used in this study. 
Uh, it's comprised of uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, the commonest of the probiotics used in critically ill patients and commonly found in yogurt, for example. Some probiotics, such as the bottom middle image, uh, represents a fungus, Saccharomyces, uh, and, and that has not had as favorable a uh, story so far with studies during critical illness. So everyone's probably heard of the Genome Project, and now there is the Microbiome Project, and there is particular interest in the microbiome and critical illness, as I mentioned. While it's understood that when people become critically ill, there's a very big change in the microbiome and a significant loss of the so-called healthy or health-promoting bacteria in the body, there's also growth of potential pathogens, some of which may actually increase the inflammatory cascade in the body. And this has been shown to be associated with risk of death. And the supposition for probiotics influencing health is that repletion of so-called beneficial bacteria that may be lost during critical illness may have therapeutic value. Does this hold water? Well, up until recently, several randomized clinical trials of critically ill patients compared various probiotics versus placebo when added to typical enteral nutrition in the ICU setting. This is a forest plot of some of the studies published over seven years ago. And you can see that the studies in total are uh, fairly few in number. You can see that overall, it appears that probiotics may decrease the risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia, and this seemed very promising. Many systematic reviews have occurred before and after this one, but this is one of the reviews that led us to think, oh, we should check and see whether pneumonia could be prevented with probiotics in a large rigorous studies. And when we looked a little deeper, we found probiotics actually have been tested in many randomized trials and have been shown to have a number of effects. So outside critical illness for healthy citizens, ambulatory patients, uh, case reports of probiotic induced infections have occurred whereby people perhaps overdosing on probiotics or having impaired gastrointestinal tract or a very poor immune system, they may actually become infected with the probiotic organism that is meant to be helpful. So that's very rare, but has occurred. Number two, you can see reduction in upper respiratory tract infections has been demonstrated in some randomized trials to the tune of 35%. Reduction in gastrointestinal outcomes, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and a number of GI disorders to the tune of about 40%, especially antibiotic-associated diarrhea, which is so common and can cause dehydration, particularly in children and in the elderly, and the most serious kind of infection, Clostridia difficile. Clostridioides, as it's now called, uh, difficile. And in sepsis is a, a recent um, large randomized trial in India showing that babies in rural India, when given probiotics compared with no probiotics, have a significant decreased risk of either death or the development of sepsis. For critically ill patients, there also have been case reports of infections caused by the very organisms that are found in food substrates, such as yogurt, in people with poor gastrointestinal system or poor immune system, for example. But it did appear that pneumonia would be reduced, overall infections, any infections could be reduced or critical illness. And this uh, was never found to have an influence on mortality. So this is when we launched prospect. And considering frailty and critical illness this is a very important confluence of conditions. We were keen to capture the clinical frailty status of everybody involved in the trial. And after the pilot began, and after we secured uh, sufficient uh, interest in centers and funding to proceed, after the first 470 patients were enrolled, we began um, judiciously collecting the um, Canadian frailty score thanks to the research coordinators across Canada, US, and Saudi Arabia. And we considered frailty first as a key feature 
of baseline characteristics. We examined frailty as a subgroup analysis for the primary outcome of pneumonia. And we wanted to reevaluate any relationship between frailty and mortality or long hospital stay. And uh, Diane Hills Ansel, our wonderful biostatistician, has, has helped us with so many of, of these analyses, including this most recent one. So these trials take a very long time. And uh, even though probiotics are available in the supermarket, we needed, of course, to have proper registration with Health Canada. And uh, Nicole Zatarik and uh, team uh, helped us put together this application. They had no objection or NOL to go ahead and do a pilot study. And then we went ahead with the findings of the pilot study, which documented feasibility to, in fact, update our Health Canada uh, documentation and go ahead with uh, their blessing to do the full trial. And you can see how long these big enterprises take. First patient in the main phase of the randomized trial uh, was in 2015 in July. And we finished up after extensive data validation from uh, Lois Saunders and uh, Mary Copland and Franz Clark and so many others who helped and eventually finished and went on to um, publish this in September. Overall, there was quite a bit of interest in this study. It was a non-technical intervention, an inexpensive intervention in the ICU setting, and the consent rate was quite high, about 78%. It ranged across centers, but the substitute decision makers or the family members, and sometimes the patients, if they were able to actually have the consent encounter, they, they agreed very often. This figure shows the number of patients randomized to either placebo or to probiotics. So it was about 1300 in each group. And we were able to establish the outcome uh, in, in each of these patients, which was incredible. So the baseline characteristics overall are shown here. The average age, you can see probiotic column, the placebo column, and the total, 2,650 patients. So overall, the age was about 60 years of age. And the PACHI score is a, an illness severity score, which shows very um, sick patients were enrolled. And of interest to this audience, particularly the clinical frailty score. So it was about 3.4 as the average, meaning um, about half the patients had a, a CF. Of, of greater and half less than 3.4. And if a clinical frailty score of five or greater is considered frail, you can see that overall about 22% of patients in this study were considered frail. Mostly medical patients and a number of admitting diagnoses. All of the patients had to be ventilated at randomization, and they were 100%. 60% of patients were on another kind of advanced life support, a drug, inotrope or vasopressors to maintain the blood pressure and heart rate. And about 8% of patients coming into this trial needed dialysis. And there were a number of other high intensity interventions. Also important for interpreting these results is that the antibiotic use prior to randomization was very high because infections are very common for critically ill patients upon admission or suspected infection is very common. So you can see, depending on how one um, analyzed this, uh, 40 to 80 percent of patients had prior antibiotics. Also, people coming into the ICU already have infections, and we were testing whether or not probiotics could reduce new infections. So the context is important here because a high proportion of patients being admitted enrolled in the study already had some infection. And you can see that any pneumonia, this row here, uh, indicates about 60% of patients were being treated for some kind of pneumonia. CAP is community acquired pneumonia. HAP is hospital acquired pneumonia that may have occurred after, say, a surgical procedure when someone was on the surgical ward. He or she may have developed 
pneumonia. And then um, ventilator-associated pneumonia can also occur early. Also, patients may have had uh, serious clostridioides difficile infection, the most dangerous type of diarrhea. Also, people getting into this study had various other infections, bacteria in their blood, for example, infection in their abdomen. And this just is to underscore that critically ill people who are very, very sick, very commonly already have an infection. So what happened in Prospect? So we gave the probiotic twice a day down the feeding tube. The bedside nurses and uh, pharmacists, uh, nutritionists helped a lot to enable this. Uh, it was made into a slurry, uh, put down the feeding tube or taken as a pill if the patient was able. And the product was given in highlighted in blue there for uh, a median of nine days. This is quite important because it wasn't a, a short sprinkling of probiotics. It was quite a um, quite a long duration of exposure, and it would potentially have been a problem if patients only received two or three doses because it's hard for any intervention if given in a very low quantity. It's hard for any intervention to make a big impact. Most patients received this very well. So conceptually, there are different definitions of pneumonia. I mentioned CAP or community acquired, HAP or hospital acquired, but our focus for probiotic possible prevention of pneumonia was VAP, ventilator associated pneumonia, which can be early or it can be late. So typically the early VAP occurs 48 hours or more for the subsequent three days after into the intubation. And then late VAP is beyond that. And then some patients, once the breathing tube comes out, if they're in the ICU, they still get pneumonia. And that we defined as an ICU acquired uh, pneumonia. So our outcomes are shown here. The lactobacillus rhamnosus GG or rhamnosus in deeper red and uh, lighter red or pink is the placebo. And without having too many uh, numerical data points here, you can um, see that there, there really was no difference. The, the probiotic did not reduce either the early VAP or the late VAP or either or the total VAP. And for events that occurred after the breathing tube was out, no difference. So any pneumonia, there was no difference. But there are many different alternatives for pneumonia. And one of the rigorous features of this study involved the collection of four pages of uh, data on the adjudication forms and many pieces of, of data by the research coordinators to allow the portrayal of pneumonia according to different criteria. There's no such thing as sort of the right type or the optimal type or definition or label, but whichever is used, there are implications for frequency. So you can see the Center for Disease Control or CDC uh, in the ICU population would lead to lower rates or impression of hardly any rates of pneumonia whatsoever if there was a requirement for the confirmation of the microbe. So this was an interesting feature. The subgroup analyses shed some light, particularly relevant for frailty. So there were five subgroup analyses. We wondered, would, for example, probiotics be um, more effective at pneumonia prevention, depending on whether patients had a medical, surgical, or trauma diagnosis. And that was not evident in this database. So the interaction p-values for all of these subgroups show no important heterogeneity of effect or no significant subgroup differences. And the um, the uh, horizontal lines indicate the point estimates and the confidence limits around these subgroups. So you can see for the clinical frailty score of five or greater, there was overlap in these confidence limits 
with the confidence limits or confidence interval just above when the clinical frailty score is less than four. So this suggests no particular advantage for frail individuals to receive probiotics when they're critically ill for the prevention of pneumonia. None of the subgroups showed a difference. What we did find though is pneumonia in and of itself is a problem. Uh, clearly it, on face value, it seems like pneumonia would be something you'd rather avoid. And using a number of different definitions, we uh, analyzed whether or not if you adjust for illness severity, does the development of pneumonia have any impact on risk of death? And the final column there shows that uh, yes, for almost all of these definitions, there's an increased risk of death when adjusted for this illness severity score, which incorporates age and physiology and chronic health at baseline. Uh, there, there is an increased risk of death associated with the development of pneumonia. And, and we know pneumonia is um, a concerning complication of critical illness and confers increased risk of death and confers increased cost. When we considered probiotics versus placebo and any infection, and I won't go through all of them with you, there also was no difference. So no, no benefit to the receipt of probiotics in the reduction of any of the individual types of infection or in total. What about the duration of time on the breathing machine? No difference was about seven days in both groups. What about the amount of time in the ICU? About 12 days in both groups, no difference. And what about the duration of time in hospital? About 22 days and no difference, no shorter duration of stay in hospital in patients receiving probiotics. What about mortality? Likewise, no reduction in mortality in the ICU or reduction in mortality in the hospital for these critically ill patients receiving twice daily probiotics. Diarrhea has also been shown in outpatients in a number of different settings to be reduced by probiotics. And there are a number of ways to diagnose diarrhea. And some studies uh, as large as, as uh, Prospect have shown that diarrhea may reduce antibiotic associated diarrhea and others have shown not so much. The definitions we employed in the ICU study here showed no benefit to uh, reducing diarrhea with the use of probiotics. And this stood uh, based on a number of other different definitions. But what we do know is probiotics can potentially be problematic and actually cause infection or be found in a sterile body site. Now, without even taking probiotics, some seriously ill patients develop lactobacillus in the blood or it's found in an abscess or some other sterile site like the fluid around the lung. And this could occur whether prospect was going on or not. In the prospect trial, some patients did indeed have lactobacillus species in various places, but when divided by, by group and when identified very carefully, the lactobacillus rhamnosus is a very specific genus, species, and strain. And there are other types of lactobacillus, even though um, we, we think that they are possibly from the probiotic, we can't be sure because some lactobacillus rhamnosus uh, strains are absolutely not uh, rhamnosus GG. And overall, what we can identify is that in this trial, more patients had definite or possible lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, or in other words, the study product, definitely or possibly found in a sterile site in the body. This was not associated with 
an inc increased risk of death or we didn't think was causative of anyone who, who died, um, but it was nonetheless potentially concerning. We then turned to other ways to analyze frailty in this database. So forgetting about probiotics for a moment, John Muscadieri and uh, Sean Bagshaw and Tom Stelfox and um, Ken Rockwood and many other individuals in, in Canada and elsewhere have been studying frailty and documenting an association between frailty status and risk of death. And in this database, we also observe this relationship. So critically ill patients often die in the ICU, as you saw, and if they do survive their critical illness and start to recover on the ward, they also may die in hospital. So this shows that patients with a clinical frailty score of five or greater do seem to have an increased risk of death. It's a statistically significant increased risk of death after considering the stratification variables of the center where the patient was enrolled, whether they were medical, surgical, or trauma admitting status. Um, and then um, there's also adjustment for the Apache 2 score. So this Apache 2 score is the illness severity score that identifies very um, clearly parameters that predict risk of death. And so this analysis shows that over and above a very strong predictor of death, this Apache score, being frail does confer an increased risk of death in the ICU or an increased risk of death in the hospital. And this is consistent with other literature in a, in a very large uh, database of uh, over 2,000 patients. What about whether frailty status predicts a prolonged hospital stay or death? The clinical supposition is frail individuals, when they come into hospital, they're very, very ill, they're in the intensive care unit, they may have a long time in the hospital. So here the outcome is 60 days, more at least, in the hospital or dying. What about patients with a clinical frailty score of five or greater? Well, yes, the same thing holds those patients when adjusted for their medical, surgical, or trauma admission status or center and the randomized group here um, and adjusted for Apache. Yes, frail patients are much more likely to have an increased length of stay in the hospital or die as, as a, a composite of those two phenomena. So this work overall was um, so exciting and rewarding to do. And we, we were just overwhelmed with the interest in the community. There's so many infections to adjudicate and review that I uh, didn't go over that process. Many lung infections, other infections, lots of source documents sent to us from uh, all over Canada and our um, collaborators in, in the US and in Saudi, lots of case report forms validated. And so um, we're so uh, incredibly grateful for all the investigators, research coordinators and, and pharmacy technicians. The, the overall rigor of this study uh, was high. Another way to say that is the risk of bias was low. It was a randomized trial. It was concealed, so nobody knew the arm to which the patients would be allocated prior to randomization. Uh, it was stratified, as I mentioned, um, blinded. Nobody knew who was receiving probiotics and who was not. And there's very high um, adherence to the protocol or high protocol fidelity. And we obtained vital status for everybody thanks to the hard work of the Method Center and research coordinators. And of course, analyze this according to the intention to treat principle. So in conclusion, among critically ill patients who require invasive mechanical ventilation, lactobacillus rhamnosus GG compared to placebo did not reduce the risk of ventilator associated pneumonia did not have any favorable impact reducing any infections or diarrhea or mortality um, and, and may cause harm uh, depending upon 
the uh, patient profile, although very strict exclusion criteria were used to ensure high-risk individuals were not incorporated in, in this trial. So these findings do not support the use of lactobacillus rhamnosus GG in the ICU. Some guidelines suggest up until this point that probiotics are used. And a Markov model economic evaluation also showed based on the earlier randomized trials I mentioned that probiotics may actually be uh, beneficial, one of the lowest cost interventions for pneumonia prevention. But that was based at a time uh, prior to this robust trial. And I think those, those guidelines need to be revisited. And even for inexpensive interventions, such as probiotics, especially relative to so many other critical care interventions, even inexpensive interventions shouldn't be used if they don't confer patient benefit. And that's what this study clearly showed. It was um, a labor of, of love. And uh, this slide just illustrates the uh, preparatory work that went into the research program uh, for Dr. Johnson's uh, PhD protocol was the pilot. And we'd done audits and systematic reviews and updated systematic reviews, the pilot study mechanistic study and a number of nested observational studies. So our review here today was about the prospect main a randomized trial, but many more sub-studies are to come. And uh, there has been an updated economic evaluation. If an intervention does not appear to be beneficial, as mentioned, it, it can really um, not very easily be economically valuable to, to, uh, to use in at least this population. Now that doesn't mean probiotics wouldn't um, be beneficial in other populations and in individuals who have uh, lower baseline risk of infection and perhaps lower baseline risk of even dying. But in this program, it was not uh, beneficial. So uh, we're very grateful to, of course, the patients and families who agreed and our coordinators, investigators, the steering committee, the adjudication committees, which reviewed all the infections very, very diligently and an extremely powerful and uh, ex dedicated method center group. Uh, none of this would have been possible without the assistance of the Canadian Frailty Network. And I hope that we can do um, additional analyses that will be of interest to uh, CFN the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group gratefully was uh, behind this as well. So I think I'll, I'll close there and see what questions or comments or discussion might be of interest to the group. Thanks, Jeanette. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, yes, truly um, a quite, a, uh, quite a labor of work there that you shared so many individuals involved. Um, We'll give a moment, I'll just begin to remind everyone that there is a Q&A button where you can um, start typing in your questions now and we'll pose um, them to Dr. Cook um, or feel free to use the chat function. Um, there was one individual who had their hand raised but I see it's down now and I don't see them on the list but if you prefer to ask, we can also, um, uh, you, can, you can also do that as well. Um, maybe I'll begin with a uh, first question. Um, here that I have. So um, Deborah, you spoke about how uh, towards the end of your presentation about how uh, certainly the practice guidelines aren't necessarily reflective of this change and, and this new um, work that you found. So is that part of the future directions or how this might be used in the future? Or um, could you share any other future directions coming from this project? Sure. Uh, thanks, Jeanette. Yes, I think most practice guidelines today are um, worthy of being considered living documents, shall we say. And just as we all uh, adapted changes in life, whatever comes our way, I think um, clinicians and all practitioners need to be aware of the literature and maybe change their viewpoint, possibly change their practice. Many studies are informing practice, don't necessarily change practice, but sometimes when guidelines are uh, suggesting an intervention or recommending an intervention, uh, they do need to be uh, updated as, uh, as you know, 
life life and evidence changes and and so too must they so i think that probably is in the works for next pneumonia prevention guidelines that may come along um, but uh, there's also the interest in in other populations and exploring this this further great um, I've, we've got a question here. Um, so someone says, based on these results, do you still believe probiotics are beneficial in one's diet? Well, it's a, it's a great question. Um, the the uh, different studies in different settings are potentially a little bit more uh, promising, I would say. So I mentioned the strongest study uh, published in, in Nature suggesting infants who very early on do not have their GI tract necessarily colonized or robust to um, possibility of acquired infections seem to have derived great benefit. So, so again, a rural India infants uh, randomized clinical trial. And it may be that in um, populations like that, probiotics are, are very beneficial. It could be that in relatively healthier uh, populations, they confer benefit. Uh, so healthy, so-called healthy citizens with minor comorbidities for um, flu prevention, for example, earlier, older, um, not always extremely rigorous studies have suggested that to, to be the case. And it could be worth um, evaluating that population once again if one is not eating anything in extreme excess, it probably does not confer harm. But this study, of course, doesn't really allow recommendations to emerge from it or from me, you know, based on the population that we examined. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think there are still health benefits in other studies in uh, other populations that people could could refer to for continued taking of, of probiotics for those who are interested. Okay. Um, one more that I have here. Um, so um, this was a follow-up to a previously funded CFN pilot, right? I believe, um, which showed promise. So um, are you able to postulate at all what some what might have been sort of the difference in expected effect. I think based on the pilot, um, there were some differences expected between the, um, the two, but uh, bet between the probiotic group and the control group, but I think the results here showed something different. So do you have any, do you or your team have any thoughts behind what that, might, why, why that might be? Well, the, um, the probiotic is, uh, pilot trial was really designed more to uh, evaluate whether or not there was public interest, uh, so the consent rate, to evaluate whether or not the community could uh, screen and have consent encounters and go ahead and randomize patients, and to be sure that the probiotic could be given um, soon after randomization, twice a day down the feeding tube. So the study was smaller, the pilot study was necessarily smaller and had different objectives and with smaller studies, um, we always take with a big grain of salt whatever um, treatment effect is, is observed and uh, there could be type one or type two error. So we, we know we need much larger studies with uh, a higher number of event rates and wider um, and narrower confidence limits for us to make some clinical recommendations. So that's why we tend not to get over enthused or despondent when a pilot trial is done, which is small because the objective is usually quite different than trying to determine treatment effects for population. We really need the big studies. So our pilot trial, um, which uh, was um, graciously funded by, by CFN, really helped us understand that it was feasible to proceed and properly evaluate probiotics in this population. Okay, great. Um, and we have had another question come in from our audience here. It says, can one conclude that eating a lot of yogurt by a frail elderly person be detrimental to their health or should their intake be limited? Well, this setting of the intensive care unit really 
um, is not the same as uh, an older person living in the community. In, I think in, in general, an excessive intake of anything is, is probably unwise. But this study doesn't bear on whether or not it's a problem for um, relatively healthy community dwelling elders to, to have probiotics. I think probably in moderation, it could be, it could be fine. The case reports of serious concerns with probiotic ingestion for community dwelling persons tends to have been excessive intake or patients who are profoundly immune compromised or patients or persons who have um, poor integrity of the gastrointestinal system. Great. Um, one other one here. Do you think other strains of probiotics may have benefit not shown with L. rhamnosus GG? Also an excellent question. Um, ideally, we would have had randomized clinical trials comparing all of the different probiotics and then would have been able to confidently select the probiotic which seems to be most favorable based on prior literature. But no such trials existed. So which sort of treating probiotics as a, as a class when really they're different organisms. And um, the way we selected this one was based on um, the most beneficial randomized trial suggesting about a 50% pneumonia reduction uh, previously, and then some consistent or supportive earlier trials. So it was one of those situations where we were, you know, picking the one that looked the most promising, selected through a careful literature review. But these natural health food products are hard to study in hospitalized patients. And there doesn't seem to be um, a robust background of comparative, it's like uh, beta blockers, people will be familiar with. There's different types of beta blockers and some of them have different properties and they may be compared one against the other and then for any given condition, you could choose the one that seems safest and most beneficial. That didn't exist in the randomized trials of probiotic use for critically ill patients. So um, it is possible that a different um, uh, genus, species, or, or strain could be more beneficial. It is possible, or even a combination, perhaps. It was mm -hmm. one genus, species, species, and strain that we uh, we used. That's possible. And one other idea is whether the administration, which we gave in the stomach through a feeding tube, uh, should or could be given rectally into the colon, where there's a lot of biologically active bacteria already, kind of like a, um, you know, colonic wash, shall we say. That, that's another idea distinct from probiotic, but focused on root or site of administration. Those are, are possible uh, benefits akin to some of the, say, the C. diff treatments. Great. Um, and then one question that here come in from the audience. Do you think changing the dose or treatment regimen would have made a difference? Hard to know. Um, we did select a dose that was as least as high as the most favorable um, randomized trial for, for this, this particular probiotic. And um, I, I would have been a little concerned about high, using higher doses than that, which may have been used before, but it's possible we just didn't study that, you know, it's possible. It's also maybe unlikely. I mean, I, I don't know. We, we didn't go with a, a tiny dose. Let's put it that way. It was, it was a substantial exposure compared with others in the literature. Sometimes okay. more is not better. I don't know. Yeah. Hard to say. Um, another question that's come in. Did you check the change in probiotics quantity or profile in the gut stool after treatment? And if so, did it change in treated people versus control or before slash after treatment? 
Also a great question. Um, there was a mechanistic sub-study done in the three sites in Hamilton, the Jervinsky Hospital, the Hamilton General Hospital, and St. Joseph's, whereby samples from the stomach and an endotracheal aspirate, but also a stool, were sent for genomic analysis to identify the bugs in those uh, fluids but also evaluate the presence of the lactobacillus rhamnosus GG in the patients randomized to probiotic. So this is a, a very good question raised. And while these results have not been published, the uh, work of uh, Mike Surrett in, in uh, his lab and uh, Daphne Lamarche, who was the PhD student working in the um, Surrett Microbiome Laboratory, they did analyze the specimens and did in fact find a substantial uh, load of lactobacillus rhamnosus in the, the stool of patients in that group. So those patients randomized to lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. Yes, it was evident in the GI tract. Um, and there was also a signal in that samples over time from those patients did illustrate the dysbiosis of critical illness. And I mentioned at the beginning, um, as uh, critical illness goes on, the, the, the gut flora from any of the different 18 body sites that are frequently sampled in microbiome work, um, it changed over time. Yes, but what um, those um, folks are wonderful collaborators have not yet analyzed is whether is, there is a difference in the resolution or speed to uh, time to resolution of that uh, dysbiosis in the probiotic versus placebo group. It's quite an enormous amount of work examining the genetic material of all the hundreds and thousands of bacteria in those samples. Uh, oh, it was over a thousand samples uh, received a while back. So we hope perhaps to shed more light on this type of mechanistic question that could guide further research or help with the interpretation of this study along the lines of questions already raised by, by this group for our trial. So great questions. Great. Um, so that is all the questions that we've had come in and we're nearing the top of the hour. So I'd just like to once again, thank you, Dr. Cook, for taking the time to join us today and for sharing the results of this prospect trial. Um, it was a significant amount of work and we're very thankful um, that you were able to undertake that and do that so that we can improve the lives of older adults living with frailty um, and, and make a difference in their, in their care going forward. So thank you again. Um, I hope it's all right that we're sharing your email address here just in case sure. anyone has questions. And also uh, we invite you to, oh, I just see, oh, there's just a thank you came in and as well from one of the participants in the Q and A there. That's what I, I thought we saw mm -hmm. had an question coming in. Um, we also invite you to visit the CFN website once again at cfn-nce.ca forward slash webinars, where we'll have a recording of today's session, um, as well as information of it and registration for upcoming webinars, um, videos from previous webinars, and to learn more about this project and Dr. Cook's research. Um, so thank you once again, Dr. Cook, and thank you to our participants today. And we look forward to welcoming you again for our next webinar on January 26th. Thank you so much.